Bible, if you would, tonight and turn with me to Daniel chapter number 4, the book of Daniel chapter number 4 in your Bible. And I'd like to begin reading tonight from Daniel chapter 4 and verse number 37. Daniel chapter 4 and verse number 37. It was years ago that a group of preachers met in the state of Indiana. It was a large, large meeting. A number of, of some of the old time, some of the famous old time preachers had gathered together. And uh, a number of men, of course, at a preacher's meeting were scheduled to preach. And one of them was a fellow by the name of Mel Trotter. He had just returned from a missions trip in Europe. And yet he said he stood up and he looked at the tremendous crowd. And he, he said he felt impressed to the Lord to give his testimony. And the missions report could wait. Mel Trotter shook his head. He said, I'm not proud of my testimony. He told the story. He lived in the city of Chicago. And, and Mel Trotter was a worthless drunk. Every time they'd have any kind of money in their family, Mel Trotter would drink it away. He was to say later, I, I don't know how my wife ever, ever stayed with me. It got so bad, they had a little baby in their family, and the little baby was sick, and Mel Trotter would go out on a drinking binge. He, he came home one day, and he walked in that little apartment, that little run-down, rat-infested apartment, and there was a doctor there, and he knew that doctor was there for free. The doctor said, Mel, your baby's sick. I don't know if we can save your baby. But if there's any hope for your baby, he handed him a note and some money. He said, I don't want you to walk. I want you to run to the pharmacy and get the prescription filled. He ran down the steps with that prescription note and the money. And yet to get to the pharmacy, he had to go by the local bar. And when he looked in and saw his buddies, he stuffed that prescription note in his pocket. And he took the money for his baby's medicine and he bought drinks. He got so drunk that night, he slept it off in the back room and and the next day when he quietly made his way home, he slipped up the steps and he opened up the door a crack and he saw a piece of furniture he'd never seen before. There was his little baby laying in a casket. Mel Trotter was miserable. So miserable he decided to end his life and was walking the streets of Chicago heading for Lake Michigan where he was going to drown himself and somebody put their hand on their shoulder and invited Mel Trotter into the old-fashioned Pacific Garden Mission where he heard the gospel story of Jesus Christ and Mel Trotter was wonderfully saved. God not only saved him, God changed him. And years later, Mel Trotter was to become a preacher of the Word of God. He told the story at that preacher's meeting in Indiana and, and there was a well-known song man by the name of Homer Rodehaver that was there. A pastor from Canada named Oswald Smith was there as well. And after the service, they were just standing around and rejoicing in the testimony of Mel Trotter, how God could save a sinner that was bound for hell. And, and, uh, and that day, that old preacher from Canada just shook his head and marveled. He said, what a difference it makes when Jesus comes. Well, Homer wrote a Haver said, that's a great message. Why don't you write some words and I'll write some music. And that's how we got the song that was sung tonight. When Jesus comes, the tempter's power is broken. When Jesus comes, the tears are wiped away. And my friend, what a difference it makes when Jesus comes into a family. Jesus comes into a heart and life. All around this building tonight, we could hear testimonies of men whose lives were ruined by sin, ladies who were burdened down, of families that were on the verge of divorce and ruin, and, and young people whose lives were shattered and bruised by what sin and Satan could produce. And yet, what a difference it makes when Jesus saves a soul. And tonight, if you don't know him, what a great night to trust Christ. What a great night to let Jesus save your soul and change your life. And if any man be in Christ, he still is a new creature. I love the message of that song. Thank you so much to Pastor Folger and, and Cleveland Baptist Church. Uh, I just want to thank you tonight for a wonderful week. Uh, your pastor is so hospitable and he's very, very gracious. And I just enjoyed the time preaching every night. You know, um, I really, once I get started, I don't care if I'm in a big old fancy church auditorium with beautiful pews or a gym. To me, it really doesn't matter. But, but I got to tell you, honestly, at Cleveland Baptist Church, there is such a good climate here to preach. You know, I, it, the truth is, when you're in a different place every week preaching all the time, you know, sometimes you really got to work at it, and sometimes you, know, you got to twist your arm a little bit, and it takes a lot of effort, but uh, this is just a good preaching place. Uh, it's just a good atmosphere here, and there's good reception. I have to say the same thing in the Christian school. We preached with the young people every day this week, and, and just a great place to preach, good climate, and it's just a good heart for what the Bible says, and, and uh, you know, that's exactly what the Lord wants in a church. People to say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. 
We thank the Lord for his working in the hearts and lives of teenagers and, and pray for your young people. Pray for your Christian school. What a tremendous opportunity that we have to see young people grow in a, in a church, in a school environment, and good homes whereby they can serve the Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness and your kindness and your graciousness and, and generosity. And I want to encourage you tonight just to keep on abounding in the work of the Lord for as much as you know your labor's not in vain in him. Daniel chapter 4 tonight, if you're physically able, may I invite you to stand together with me and I'd like to read from verse number 37. Daniel 4, 37, the Bible says, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and extol and honor the King of heaven, all whose works are truth and his ways judgment. And notice this statement carefully, and those that walk in pride he is able to abase. My Savior, I pray once again tonight that you would move upon this place with the power of the Spirit of God. And Lord, the words of a man are vain words, and the words of a church cannot change and save. Yet we know the Word of God combined with the power of the Spirit of God can affect and change people for eternity. Lord, for someone here tonight that has never been born into God's family, they've never been saved. How I pray that tonight would be the night that you'd break their heart and you'd break down that one thing. And that even tonight they would trust Jesus Christ and they would be saved. Then, Lord, I pray your word would stir up the souls and your people, the hearts and minds. Do a work of revival, we ask in Jesus, our Savior's name. Amen. Thank you and please be seated. In the book of Mark, chapter 10, the Bible tells us that a most impressive man came to see the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Bible calls him a rich, young ruler. Now, I recognize those three words perhaps are not impressive to us that live in America, but 2,000 years ago, those were three words that never went together. I mean, in Bible times, the words rich and young never went together. Uh, the only wealthy people were those that had a lifetime of labor, yet even more rare would be to find a young ruler. Why, rulers in Bible times, those were the ones that had some seasoning in their hair. Those were the ones that had a lifetime of experience. And so when this rich young ruler in Mark 10 uh, comes running to Jesus and kneeling to Jesus, understand tonight he was an extremely extraordinary man. And you know, the Bible tells us, at least I believe he came with a real tender heart. I don't think there was a show and I don't think there was any pretense. He came running to Christ, kneeling to Christ and saying, good master, what shall I do uh, that I may inherit eternal life? Now, those of us who are saved tonight, we understand, number one, there is no good thing you do to inherit eternal life because salvation is by the grace of God. It is not of works, lest any man should boast. And not only that, salvation is the gift of God, Romans 6, 23. It's not something we inherit from our loved ones. But having said that, I think you'd have to look at this man and say he was a sincere man. So now the Lord Jesus looks at our rich young ruler friend and, and I guess he looked at it and thought, well, this is a hypothetical question. What good thing can I do to inherit eternal life? So Jesus said, I'll give him a hypothetical answer. And he looked at him and he said, you know the law. And Jesus in Mark 10 listed five of what we call the Ten Commandments. And I find it fascinating that he was talking to a politician and he added one, defraud not. Don't know why, maybe there's a connection there. But he told them, here are the commandments. He started listing them for him. Honor thy father and thy mother. Remember the Sabbath. He starts to list the commandments for this rich young ruler. And the Bible tells us that this young man looks at the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's almost incredible that he could look at the one who knew him. The one that had created him. The one that could cry out any one of his most inner thoughts. And you know what he said? All these have I kept from my youth up. Incredible. From the time of my bar mitzvah and I was responsible for the law, Lord, you're looking at somebody who's never sinned. I have kept the whole law. Well, now, the Bible says Jesus looked at him, and I love the phrase, he beheld him, it says, and he loved him. You know, the Lord just had a special love for this rich young ruler, and I find the next thing that he told him to be powerful. He said, one thing thou lackest. One thing. 
Not, buddy, you are so far from heaven that we got a list of 30 things for you to deal with. Not 47 things that you're going to have to correct before I'll even talk to you. Uh, but the Lord Jesus looked at a guy that close to heaven and he said, sir, there's just one thing you lack. There's just one thing you miss. There's just one thing in your life that is keeping you from being saved. And so that one thing, I want you to go sell everything you have and give it to the poor. Take up your cross and follow me. And the Bible says the man went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Now you can imagine if you were one of the 12 disciples, the Bible says they were knocked out of their senses. They were absolutely astonished. And they're looking here, scratching their heads saying, now what is this? I thought we'd been taught that salvation is not by works or righteousness, which we have done. I thought if it was by grace, then it is no more works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. I thought if it was by works, then it's no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. And these disciples are shocked. What is this? Jesus said, if you want to go to heaven, go sell everything you have. Give it to the poor and come follow me. And then Jesus put it like this. How hard, how hardly it is for those who have riches to enter into the kingdom of God. In fact, he said, it'd be easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to go to heaven. Now, every man in here appreciates that. I got to tell you, I do. I had an extreme emergency today. I had to get a sewing kit and I had to thread a needle. Boy, do I hate that. I'd rather, I'd rather eat a banana or something than have to thread a needle. And I know when I'm looking at that dumb little thing and that dumb little thread, it's going to take me all afternoon because a man's fingers can't get that thread and that needle to work. I don't know how you ladies do it. Man, now I can't even see it, let alone do it. But I promise you, it's impossible for me. And Jesus said it's so hard for a rich man to go to heaven, you'd be better off trying to get a camel through the eye of the needle. And now the disciples are really astonished because not only is that hard, that's impossible. And they're shocked and they don't understand. But the Lord Jesus... Jesus went on to explain to his disciples what he meant. Don't miss this statement. He said, here's the problem, gentlemen. The problem with our rich young ruler is that he was trusting in his riches. You see... The problem was not that he was rich. A lot of rich people in the Bible are saved. The problem is not that he had a lot of money. Well, a lot of people with money go to heaven. But the problem with this rich young ruler is that he had to make a choice in his life. And there was one thing that was keeping him from trusting Christ. For that rich young ruler, he had to decide, am I going to trust in my riches or am I going to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ? And you know, for most of us, we shrug our shoulders and say, that's not a problem for me. There's no riches to trust in in the first place. But you know, I suspect we could have somebody in this room who maybe has a few more zeros at the bank account than most of us do. And they'd shake their head and say, yeah, I do understand that. Because there is a tendency for wealthy people they would rather trust in their riches than they would trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and for Mr. Rich Man that rich young ruler he had a choice to make one thing do you trust in riches or do you trust in Christ remember John 3 what a great story Old Nicodemus sneaks out of the city at night, you know, and he's looking around, making sure nobody can see him. Maybe to the Garden of Gethsemane, I don't know, but he comes to meet the Lord Jesus. And, and in John 3, verse number 1, every time I read that verse, I say, doesn't that sound like the reverend for you? You know, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God. Why can't you say, hello, how are you, like everybody else? You know, why is it that when you meet the minister down at the gas station, he's a good old guy. You meet him at Walmart, he's a good old guy. But you get him up in the pulpit at the wrong place in the wrong time, and they take 45 minutes to say hello. And this guy's got a big, long, fancy speech. And don't you love the way Jesus does it? He looks through all the verbiage and all the rest of this. He looks through all the smokescreen of religion, and he's got five words. You must be born again. I love that. But folks, I find John 3 to be so fascinating. And let me tell you why. We look at John 3, and of course we all know John 3, 16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. And you know, that's a verse in our mind that we kind of relegate to the boys and girls. Why, one of the first verses the young people in this room will ever learn is John 3, 16. I suspect there are three and four-year-old children right here tonight that could stand up and they could quote John 3, 16. And you know, we think John 3, 16 is so simple. It is so glorious. It is the gospel as simple as you can get it. Why, we give John 3, 16 to the little toddlers 
Do you know who Jesus gave John 3.16 to? The Reverend Dr. Theologian Nicodemus. In fact, when you read John 3, the Reverend Dr. Theologian, and by the way, he wasn't some young pup that just graduated from the cemetery, uh, uh, the seminary last week. This guy was a learned master ruler teacher. He was the big guy. I mean, when he would show up, everybody was silent. When he come in the synagogue, they'd pack the place out. Everybody loved Dr. Nicodemus. And you read John chapter 3, and it's fascinating to me to watch Jesus deal with Dr. Nicodemus. And he takes this theologian, and you know, they're all those guys are so proud of their degrees, and they're so proud of their knowledge. And that's why it takes them a half an hour to say hello. They got to impress you how smart they are. And the Lord Jesus took the reverend theologian Dr. Nicodemus and he brought him down to the place where he was saying what what I've never heard that I've never seen that I didn't know that and it was so bad Jesus had to say who are you you're the master ruler in Israel and you don't even know this stuff and the verse that we give to the little boys and girls Jesus gave to Reverend Dr. Nicodemus do you know why he had his one thing and the one thing for Dr. Nicodemus was that religious pride, the degree on the wall. The one thing for Dr. Nicodemus was his family heritage. It was all the degrees, walking into the room, and doctor, 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 Matthew 23. And oh, the great Reverend Nicodemus, you come and sit in the high seat. And why, if you have anything to say, say on. And before the man could get saved, Jesus had to deal with that religious pride. He had his one thing. How about John chapter 4? Remember that little lady at the well? Isn't that a great story? Jesus is in Jerusalem. He says, okay, gentlemen, we got to go up north, up to Galilee. And, and they open up their computer, open up MapQuest. Okay, we got the map ready to go. Up, right, we always do, up the northern car, the eastern country, up and down the mountains. A lot of robbers, dangerous route, but that's how we do it. And Jesus said, not this time. We must needs go through Samaria. And you can hear somebody like Judas or Thomas or probably Simon the Zealot. You know, those were the guys that had Masada. You can hear him say, Samaria. Samaritans live there. And so now they get this little track up to Samaria. And you know the story. Jesus sits at the well. The disciples had gone in the city to buy lunch. And here comes this woman of Samaria at noon. She comes at noon because she couldn't come with the other ladies. No doubt they hated her. And now Jesus says, woman, give me to drink. And she's stunned. How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me who am the woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus forgot all that. Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give shall never thirst. And the lady said, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Now I promise you, folks, had that lady made that statement, I'm afraid, in some independent Baptist churches in 2009, oh, that would have been it. That would have been it. Right up here on your knees. Here's the prayer. Jesus, I believe you had me come in my heart saying, Yeah, man, put one up on the scoreboard. We got another one in and we're ready to go. <laughs> but there was a problem. There was the one thing. So Jesus said, Woman, go call thy husband. <laughs> the one thing. Sir, I have no husband. Well, Jesus said, no, you've had five husbands and now you're living with another man and that thou saidest truly. And I can see this lady's eyes are shocked and bugged out and she said, sir, I perceive that thou art a prophet. That's not going to get it done, ma'am. I'm sorry, but a prophet never died on a cross and a prophet never rose again. You don't need a prophet or a preacher to go to heaven. And then she does a stunning thing, doesn't she? Here is an adulteress. Here is a woman that has just been exposed in her sin. And you know what she does? This is fascinating to me. She starts talking religion. You know, if your pastor were to visit the dirtiest, darkest center in this county tomorrow, I mean the dirtiest center, 50 miles square, if he were to go see the dirtiest center in town, as soon as that guy, named whatever sin you want to name, found out that Pastor Folger was a preacher, you know what he would do? He would try to impress your pastor with how much religion he had. They do it all the time. And this woman says, you know, you say Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship, and we say this mountain is the place where men ought to worship. She's got it wrong. Number one, lady, you don't need a prophet, and number two, you especially don't need a religion. 
And the Lord Jesus said, Ma'am, forget about all your hills and all your mountains because God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Lady, you don't need a prophet to go to heaven. Lady, you don't need a religion or a mountain to worship him to go to heaven. And then she looked up and she said, I heard that Messiah cometh. Yeah. She's getting there now. And Jesus said, I that speak unto thee am he. And you know, I believe as soon as he said that, that was the moment that lady was saved. Don't you love the story? She left the water pots there. She went back into Samaria and she tells, the Bible says, she told all the men of the city, come see a man who told me all that ever I did. And for some strange reason, when this lady said that, all the men of the city came out to hear. Boy, did you ever put that one together? I wonder why, you know. And two days later, when Jesus left the city, those men said, now we believe, not because of her testimony. We've heard him ourselves, and know indeed this is the Christ. You see, that lady had her one thing, didn't she? And for that lady, the one thing was this. I've got a life full of adultery. Do I want my sin, or do I want a Savior to wash my sin away? Now, please don't misunderstand tonight. Nobody will ever go to heaven because they quit sinning. Nobody ever goes to heaven because they quit drinking, because they quit smoking, because they quit carousing. Nobody ever went to heaven because they quit lying. Nobody ever went to heaven because they quit sinning. You and I don't have the power to quit sin, and even if we could, that does not give us a road to heaven because it's definitely not by works. But at the same time, when somebody's being saved, they are trusting Jesus to wash their sins away. And when somebody says, I want Jesus, but I want to keep my sin, you don't want Jesus. Because if you want Jesus, you want him to wash your sins away. You want his forgiveness. You want his cleansing. Salvation is all about Jesus washing our sins away like they were never done. So now in the eyes of God, we can be made righteous. And when somebody says, I want Jesus and I want my sin, then you've got one thing you've got to deal with in your life. And it really doesn't matter what that one sin may be. That thing has got to be dealt with. And for somebody in this building, maybe you're living where this woman in Samaria was. Maybe there's some other sin. But tonight you come into a place like this and, and you get confronted with the word of God and you've got to decide, do I want Jesus to wash my sins away or would I rather have my sin? You'll never go to heaven by quitting sin. But if you want Jesus, you want him to wash your sins away. And if you don't want your sins washed away, you don't want Jesus. Do you see it tonight? One thing. He tells a rich young ruler, just one thing. Are you going to trust me or your riches? He tells Nicodemus one thing. You want your religious proud and all, pride and all your degrees or do you want me? He tells this lady, there's one thing. Do you want your sin or do you want me to wash your sin away? One thing, one thing. And I wonder tonight if there's somebody in this building, a man, a lady, a young person, and they've got just one thing that is keeping them from Christ. In the Old Testament, the Bible tells us the story of a king named Nebuchadnezzar. And you know, he had his one thing. And for Nebuchadnezzar, his one thing was one of these inherently evil things that all of us males have to deal with. You know what his was? It's at the end of verse 37. Those who walk in pride, he is able to abase. You know what it was for Nebuchadnezzar? That dirty evil, male pride. You know that pride, of course you ladies do, that pride that says, I am not stopping in that gas station and asking for directions. <laughs> you know that pride. And the Bible tells us it took an entire lifetime for God to work over Nebuchadnezzar. And I think like Jesus looked at that rich young ruler and beheld him and loved him, that God in heaven looked at Nebuchadnezzar and loved him. How he must have loved him. Because there was a lot of good things to say about Nebuchadnezzar. Oh, you study the history of the man. He was an incredible ruler. He was a great warrior. He was a religious man. He was an intelligent man, a discerning man. He was the one who built the famous uh, hanging gardens. He was a man that built a powerful empire. He was a patient man. His father was vicious and angry angry and mean, but he was kind. He was a family man. There was a lot of good things that history tells us about Nebuchadnezzar. But the guy had his one thing. 
Would you take a few minutes tonight and look with me to the book of Daniel? And, and I want you to see some things that God brought into the life of Nebuchadnezzar to deal with his one thing. Go back, if you would, to Daniel chapter 1 and... And notice first that God sent him a faithful man. God sent him a faithful man. And Daniel 1 in verse number 8, the Bible says, But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's meat, nor with the wine which he drank. Now every day the Bible tells us Daniel standing before King Nebuchadnezzar. The Word of God tells us in history as well that there were three occasions where the Babylonians attacked the city of Jerusalem. The first time they took a number of young men like Daniel and his buddies, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Could we get the names right? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that's what the unsaved people call them. God called them Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. We don't talk about Belteshazzar in the lion's den, so we can get their names right according to the Bible. All right, so Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, Daniel, and other young men, they were carried away. One day the puppet king that the Babylonian empire had established rebelled against Babylon. So they sent a fellow named Nebuzaradan, a general. He conquered Jerusalem the second time. They installed another puppet king. When he rebelled against Nebuchadnezzar in Babylon, that was it. Three strikes and you're out. And that's when Nebuchadnezzar leveled that city. You'll read the story in the book of Lamentations. So now here's some young men that have been carried away as captives. In Daniel chapter 1, the Bible tells us in verse number 9, the first thing that happened is their futures were taken away. There would be no Mrs. Daniel. There would be no little children. And for all the years that Daniel was to live in Babylon, there would be no tomorrow. There would be no next generation. And yet, my friend, despite the fact he was a captive, and despite the fact that Daniel was taken away, despite for all the horror and the heartache in his life, the Word of God tells us that right to the end he was a man with a wonderful spirit for God because one day in Daniel 1 and 8 Daniel made a choice that every single one of us need to make I love that verse it says that Daniel purposed in his heart hey would every young person here tonight notice carefully that that word purposed is a past tense verb now, that's powerful because, you see, when the servants came and said, come on, it's time to go into the lunch hall and we've got some food from King Nebuchadnezzar and he's got some wine for you to drink, the Bible tells us that Daniel and his three buddies, they had already purposed in their heart. In other words, when the opportunity to sin came along, they didn't figure out what are we going to do now. You can almost hear their buddies saying, well, when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And when in Babylon, do as the Babylonians do. You can almost hear it. Well, we don't want to offend anybody. You know, we want to be a soul winner and we want to see the king get saved. And how is he going to get saved if we offend him? You can hear all the thinking. It's the same thing you and I do. But when they brought the booze in, Daniel and his three friends very graciously and very kindly said no. Because do you see the key? When the booze came in, they didn't figure out, what am I going to do now? They had already made that decision. And mom and dad, that's why it's so important to have your young people in a good Christian school. It's why it's so important in the summertime to say, nope, you're going to have to take a week off and go to camp. It's so important to get them away from their texting and away from the TV and away from all the rest of it and the Facebooks and, and all of it and get away and get around the dose of Bible. And when they get around the Word of God, God can begin to work in their heart. And that's why in a place like this, this is the time to make a decision. I'm deciding right now that I am not going to make a moral mess of my life, that I am not going to drink the devil's liquor, that I am not going to get in the, involved in the devil's ways and plans. And when Daniel purposed long before the opportunity ever came to sin, he had already decided what he was going to do. And I would say tonight, sir, lady, young people, you and I would do well to decide right here in a place like this that I am deciding tonight what I am going to do when sin comes knocking on the door. He purposed in his heart. What a story. No wonder when you come to the end of Daniel chapter 1. In verse 19, when the king communed with them, among them all was found none like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore stood they before the king. And how is this for a testimony? It says, in all manners of wisdom and understanding that the king inquired of them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in all his realm. Hey, even the unsaved king had to say, these guys are ten times better. They have a better spirit. They have a better knowledge. They have more wisdom. They have a better God. They have a better attitude. And the Bible says that King Nebuchadnezzar found those boys ten times better. 
Well, now in chapter 2, the king has a dream. You've had this happen to you. He has a dream and he wakes up and the dream is gone. The Bible tells us that he had dreamed of an image with a head made of gold. The brass and the arms were made of silver. The belly and the thighs were made of brass. And the legs and the feet were made of iron and iron mixed with clay. Now the king has this dream and he wakes up thinking, what did I dream? What was that all about? He says, I forgot the dream, but I know it was significant. So he calls in all the ministers from the National Council of Churches. He lines them right up and says, here's the deal. Number one, tell me what I dreamed. And number two, tell me what it means. Or number three, you're going to die. And the guy says there to head reverend from the council, well, king, all you got to do is tell us the dream and, and we'll come up with a whopper. Ah, I mean a good interpretation. We're good at that. And the king said, that's the deal. I forgot the dream. Now, if you guys aren't a bunch of frauds and phonies and false prophets, tell me what I dreamed and tell me what it meant. And the head reverend had to shake his head and say, nobody can do that. Well, like the old song says, Daniel may have been singing it. They're coming to take me away, you know. And, and son, Daniel says, what's wrong? He hears the story. And old Daniel says, look, I got to tell you, I don't know what the king dreamed, but I know who knows. Amen. And God went, gave Daniel the interpretation of the dream. You read his praise in chapter 2, verse 20. Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. He changeth the times and the seasons. He removeth kings and setteth up kings. He giveth wisdom unto the wise and knowledge to them that know understanding. What a story. So Daniel goes in front of the king. And do you know what he did that day? It's and honestly one of the most impressive prophecies human ears have ever heard. Literally, Daniel laid out for King Nebuchadnezzar the next four empires or six centuries of human history. Can you imagine? Imagine Pastor Folger standing up in church in a new auditorium on Sunday, and he says, I got this vision and this revelation. And what if he could tell you and me who the President of the United States was going to be in the year 2150? Or if there was even going to be a United States in the year 2150? And that day, Daniel stood in the palace of the king with a teeming, angry reverence standing on the side, and he laid out 600 years of coming human events. What a prophecy. Well, notice how Nebuchadnezzar responds in your Bible. In chapter 2, verse number 47, the king answered unto Daniel and said, Of a truth it is that your God is a God of gods and a Lord of kings and a revealer of secrets, seeing thou couldst reveal this secret. Folks, do you see it in that verse? He say, well, that's an impressive verse. And then he turns around, he makes Daniel a ruler in the kingdom. And you know, that's an impressive thing and why he was honored. Yet, my friend, in verse number 47, there's a critical problem, isn't there? Notice it again. The king made him a great man, it says, but he said, of a truth it is, get it, that your God is the God of gods. Do you see the difference? Here is this proud man saying, Daniel, I got to admit that your God is the God of gods, that your God reveals secrets, that your God knows the heart and the mind. I have to say that your God is bigger than all the gods of Babylon. I have to say that your God is the God of gods. But do you see it tonight? He wasn't willing to humble himself and bow his knee and say, I want your God to be my God. And no one can ever go to heaven until they're willing to humble themselves, to break down that old pride and say, I am a sinner and I need a Savior. I don't need a religion. I need a Savior. I don't need a church. I need a Savior. And you know, maybe for some sweet, humble lady here tonight, that's not a problem. And maybe for some tender-hearted young person, that's not a problem. But you know, for some of us old men here with that dirty old pride that loves to rear up in our hearts, you mean I need Christ? I wonder how many people come Sunday after Sunday after Sunday to Cleveland Baptist Church. A man figured it out a long, long time ago. All I have to do is go to church for an hour on Sunday morning. My wife is happy. I get a good lunch out of it. And we have a good marriage. And you know, if you figured that out, you are smarter than the average guy out there. I got to give you credit. So you started coming to church and maybe somebody's been here for years. And maybe for years you heard Brother Thompson preach and then Brother Folger preach and, and something happened that you weren't counting on. 
Because the more they preach that Bible, the more that Bible broke into your heart and you know you need to be saved and you know you need to be born again and you know you need Christ. And yet I wonder how many men will sit in that auditorium across the parking lot on Sunday morning will listen to Pastor Folger for the hundredth time, maybe more, and yet when they sit there, they're going to say, I know I need to be saved. I know I'm a sinner. I know I'm going to die, but I am not walking down that aisle and trusting the Christ of my wife. That's not happening. And until you swallow that pride and you're wanting and trusting Jesus as your only Savior, you can't go to heaven. And there's a man, maybe a lady, maybe a young person tonight. You'd have to say, the truth is, I admit my wife's God. My wife's Savior is real. The Savior of my mom and dad, he's the real God. You'd have to admit tonight that the God of Pastor Folger is a powerful God. But as long as it's Pastor Folger's God, or your wife's God, or your parents' God, or your neighbor's God, it's somebody else's God. As long as your God is a God of God's, never becomes, I want him as my Savior. And you can't go to heaven. There's that one thing. The Bible tells us in Exodus 15 and verse 2, the Lord is my strength and song. He has become my salvation. He is my God. 2 Samuel 22, 3, the God of my, of my rock, in him will I trust. He is my shield and the horn of my salvation. He is my high tower, my refuge, and my Savior. And my friend, if you ever want to be rescued from hell and if you want a home in heaven, you don't need a Savior you need Jesus as your own Savior. And so many men have that dirty, ugly pride rear its head. One thing. God sent him a faithful man. Notice God loved this king so much, he not only sent him a faithful man, he also sent him a fearless witness. Go, if you would, to chapter number 3. You know the story. Nevertheless, the king made an image of gold whose height was three score cubits and the breadth of six cubits. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. You talk about pride. You talk about the pride of thine heart hath deceived thee. Those who walk in pride. Why, this king is so proud he makes an image of himself almost a hundred feet in the air. He puts it way out in the valley in the plains of Dura and then he passes the law. He said, when you hear the harp, sackbut, sultry, dulcimer, music, all kinds of music, I I want you to fall down and worship me and if you don't fall down and worship me you will be cast alive into the burning fiery furnace now please don't misunderstand the story you know it's, it's not like the three boys Hananiah, Mishael and Azariah and by the way did you ever wonder where Daniel was you know for the longest time I did and, and the Bible doesn't say so we don't know but let me just give you one possibility all right remember there were three occasions where Nebuchadnezzar attacked Jerusalem the first time he took Daniel and his buddies as captives. Years later, they rebelled. He sent a general to put it down. He established a second king. That second king, and forgive me for the exact lineage, but I think he was like a second or third cousin of Daniel. And the time frame would just about work, so it's very possible the reason Daniel wasn't there in chapter 3 is he may have been an embass on a journey for the king to establish the king of Jerusalem. Perhaps, perhaps not. Wherever he was, I can promise you he wasn't there. So now the king builds this image, and please understand that I've been in Muslim countries, and I've seen this kind of thing. You've seen it on the news. When they go to a mosque, when it's time to pray Friday afternoon in a Muslim nation, I mean, people might be driving down what we call an interstate, but at noon they stop. And they'll leave their car in the middle of the road, get out, and they get on their face, and for one hour they pray towards Mecca. Every time you go into a hotel room in a Muslim country, there's a little arrow, which way is Mecca? And you know when they pray, you've seen the pictures in the mosque, it's not like you and I are praying and thanking the Lord for breakfast, you know, they don't give it one of these. But they put their forehead on the ground, and they lie prostrate before their God. And in Daniel chapter 3, it wasn't like these boys said, yeah, you know, when everybody else gives it one of these, we'll kind of just keep our head up and maybe nobody will notice. When that music began to play and everybody put their forehead into the dust of the ground, there was no way they wouldn't be discovered. So now they drag him in before the king. 
And the Bible tells us in verse 14, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said unto them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Do not you serve my gods, nor worship the golden image which I have set up. Now if you be ready at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, sultry, and dulcimer, and all kinds of music, you fall down and worship the image which I have made well. But if you worship not, ye shall be cast the same hour into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is this God? that will deliver you out of my hand. Right about here, you've got a classic verse in the Bible, don't you? Those boys didn't need a second chance at righteousness. And they looked up and said, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us out of the burning, fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thy hand, O king. But if not, be it known unto thee that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. We don't need a second chance. We don't need another opportunity. These three boys got it right the first time. Well, you know the story, that angry Nebuchadnezzar said, make the fire seven times hotter. It was so hot, the soldiers that tossed them in, they were licked up in the flames and they turned to dust, they died. And later you can almost see that arrogant King Nebuchadnezzar as he says, all right, let's just see if we can't find a bone. Let's see if we can't find a tooth. Let's just see if we can't find some testimony that we can use to remind people what happened when they stand against me. Watch him as he walks up to the fire. And in verse number 24, Nebuchadnezzar the king was astonished and rose up in haste and spake and said unto his council, Did not we cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered and said unto the king, True, O king. He answered and said, Lo, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no heart. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. There's four men in there, and the fourth one is like Jesus. You know, there may be somebody here tonight, you have one of those new and improved Bibles. You know, they try to help us out, and, and they come along, and they look at verse number 25, and they say, oh, God, boy, how silly is this? How would Nebuchadnezzar ever be able to recognize Jesus? Obviously, he can't be talking about Jesus, so they change that verse to correct it for us. And tell us that the form of the fourth was like a son of the gods. Of course, I could ask, well, how would he know what a son of the gods look like? I suppose the Jehovah Witnesses would like that translation, wouldn't they? I'll say, okay then, preacher, how was he able to look in that fire and know it was Jesus? And you know, there's a real good answer to that. Because every day, standing in his palace as a ruler was a fellow by the name of Daniel. And what we know about Daniel later from the book of Daniel is that he was what we call a soul winner. And Daniel had the heart to turn people to righteousness. And in the book of Daniel, it is loaded with verses about the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the stone made without hands. He's the ancient of days. I can tell you how we could look in that fire and instantly know who it was because he already knew that his gods couldn't walk through a fire. The reason he could look in that fire and know that it was the Son of God was because Daniel had already explained to him who the Son of God was. So now, he brings the boys out of the fire. There's not a hair in their body that is singed. Their clothes don't even smell of smoke. What are you going to do, Nebuchadnezzar? You have just seen an astounding miracle. Notice, please, what happens. The Bible tells us in verse number 28, Nebuchadnezzar spake and said, Blessed be the God, here's the problem, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who sent his angel and trusted in him. I said his angels delivered his servants that trusted in him and have changed the king's word and yielded their bodies that they may not serve nor worship any God except their own God. And there it is again, isn't it? It's the same thing. I got to tell you, Daniel's God, he's the God of gods. I got to tell you that these three boys, their God's a powerful God. He's a mighty God. He's the son of God. He's a great God. And he regarded God and he respected God and he recognized God. But it's still their God. <laughs> you mean I got to humble myself and make their God my God? That's not happening. Those who walk in pride, he is able to abase. So God sends him a faithful man, a fearless witness. Notice if you would please, number three, God sent him a somber warning. In Daniel chapter 4, the man has another dream. 
This time he has a dream of a great fruitful tree. The tree has its branches extended, but it is cut down. The fruit scatters everywhere. Soon there's nothing left in the field but a stump, and that stump becomes wet with dew. Now this time there's no reason to call the reverends from the council. He goes right to Daniel. Daniel gets the dream from God revealed, and Daniel is troubled and concerned to the place where the king has to tell him, don't let it trouble you, Daniel. Don't let it trouble you. And Daniel says, Bel or Nebuchadnezzar, this king, this dream is to your enemies. And he tells him what's going to happen. Like that mighty tree was cut down, God is going to cut you down. And like that tree was scattered its fruit, that's what's going to happen to you. And so you're going to become a, someone living like the beast of the land for seven long years. Now can you see in verse 27, old Daniel's got the tears running down his face and he gives the invitation. Wherefore, O king, let my counsel be acceptable unto thee and break off thy sins by righteousness and thine iniquity by showing mercy to the poor. It may be a lengthening of thy tranquility. Daniel says one day God's going to humble you, sir. One day God is going to knock you down. Why don't you repent now? Why don't you humble yourself before him? And after that dream, it took 12 long months before the Bible tells us in verse number 30, the king spake and said, Is not this great Babylon that I have built for the house of the kingdom by the might of my power and for the honor of my majesty? And while the word was in the king's mouth, the mouth there fell a voice from heaven saying, O king Nebuchadnezzar, to thee it is spoken, the kingdom is departed from thee. And just like God promised, Nebuchadnezzar was stricken with insanity. For seven years, he lived like an animal out in the forest. Can you imagine a quarantine they must have put around that area? And they would look through their field glasses, had they them in the day, and, and they would see this king. They would see him crawling on all fours. The Bible says his fingers grew like claws. The Bible says his hair was long and it was matted like eagle's feathers. And the Bible says for seven long years that he lived like a beast because those who walk in pride, God is able to abase. What is it going to take, Nebuchadnezzar? God put Daniel in your palace and you wouldn't get saved. God you to see the Son of God in the fire deliver his servants and you still wouldn't be saved. What is it going to take? And God finally had to bring him down and put him with the beast of the field for seven long years. After seven years in verse number 34, Nebuchadnezzar said, I lifted up mine eyes unto heaven. My understanding returned unto me and I blessed the Most High. I praised and honored him that liveth forever, whose dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom is from generation to generation. In verse 36, at the same time, my reason returned unto me, and the glory of my kingdom, mine honor and brightness returned unto me, and my counselors, my Lord, sought unto me, and I was established in my kingdom, and excellence, majesty was added unto me. But notice before that happened in verse 35 what he realized. All the inhabitants of the earth are reputed as nothing. He doeth according to his will in the army of heaven. Among the inhabitants of the earth, none can stay his hand or say unto him, What doest thou? Now we've got a different king. Before it was my power, now it's his power. Before it was my kingdom, and now it is his. Before it was my majesty, and now it is his. And those who walk in pride, God is able to abase. So, what's it going to take for God to get the heart of some man here tonight? What's it going to take, teenager, for you to humble yourself and come to Christ and be saved? What's it going to take? I remember preaching at a church in New Hampshire a few years ago and after the service one night I was speaking with a lady in the church and, and she told me how for years and years she had prayed for her husband to be saved. She would frequently invite him to come and hear preaching and, and he was a kind man, a good husband, but he always said, you know, I work hard all week and Sunday morning's my golfing time, my fishing time, my hunting time and I spend that with my buddies. I, I really don't want to go to church. And that was for years and years until one day the man contracted cancer and they gave him a few weeks to live. The assistant pastor went into that hospital room and again and again and one day he opened up the Bible and showed him how to be saved. 
And though he'd heard the gospel many times over the years, now he was ready and he called on the name of Christ and he was saved. He said, come on, preacher, you think somebody could get saved like that? I could show you a fellow we call the thief on the cross. He had one foot in hell and the other was sliding real quick. And the Lord reached down and rescued that man when he was a heartbeat away from the wrath of God. The day after he was saved, his wife was sitting in the room with him, and he didn't know, but he had less than 10 days to live. His wife was sitting there, and, and he would go in and out of his naps and sleep, and when she looked over, she saw some tears coming down her husband's face, and she walked over and said, are you okay? And he said, I think so. And she said, then why are you crying? And through the tears, he looked up and said to his wife, you know, I only wish that I could have all those Sunday mornings back. Those who walk in pride, he is able to obey. So what's it going to take? I grew up not far from here in Connecticut, and my dad had played a little minor league baseball. We, we always enjoyed baseball. We lived 100 miles from Fenway Park in Boston and 101 miles from Yankee Stadium in New York. And in the summer times, frequently, free, very frequently, we would take the trip to one place or another and, and catch a game. I, of course, being a righteous man, loved the Red Sox. And, and my two brothers, they liked the Yankees. Pray for them. <laughs> Just pray for them. I remember as a boy going to Yankee Stadium in the late 60s, and he was at the end of his career, but it was still an impressive thing to go to Yankee Stadium and watch a guy named Mickey Mantle play. You know, the young people here tonight, Mickey Mantle in his day was everything that, that uh, a LeBron James would be today or a Tiger Woods would be today. Everything that the superstar athletes, I mean, Hollywood made songs and movies about him. Everybody knew Mickey Mantle. I mean, he not only was a great player, he had a name to go along with it. Mickey Mantle indeed was an outstanding player. He had 536 home runs, more than 1,500 RBIs. He batted 298 for his career, and he did it all without the benefits of steroids. He was the real deal. And I remember going to Yankee Stadium and watching Mickey Mantle at the end of his career. What a thing to see. But you know, Mickey Mantle's career was cut short because of sin. You see, Mickey Mantle, when the games were over, would love to hit the town with his drinking buddy Whitey Ford and his fornicating buddy Billy Martin. And night after night, they would go to their parties, they would drink their liquor, they had the pleasures of sin for a season. But one day, all the liquor began to ruin the body and began to break down even a Hall of Fame world-class athlete like Mickey Mantle. And I'll never forget the last time I saw Mickey Mantle. He was going to die and he was going to give his final press conference. The sports network ESPN showed it live. And it must have been 10, 15 years ago now, and, and that frail man that I watched as a boy club home runs out of Yankee Stadium, that frail man hobbled up to the lectern, and he, he had to hold on with both sides, and, and now that muscled man was weakened, and that great world-class athlete was only a shell of what he used to be. And I'll never forget he stood up behind that mic and he said this, I have a message for the young people of America. What's Mickey Mantle going to say? What's this Hall of Fame superstar going to say? Follow your dreams. Mickey Mantle looked into the camera and do you know what he said? He said, don't be like me. What a thing to say at the end of your life. You know, as soon as he said that, my mind instantly went to our church, and you have the same, I'm sure, where you have your missionary pictures and your prayer letters. And, and my mind instantly went to that, and, and I began to think, I, I wonder how many missionaries have spent 50 years in the mission field, and, and now they're ready to go to heaven. Maybe there's a body full of disease. And, and I wonder how many missionaries have come to the end of their life and have stood up in a church service like this and, and said, I live for Christ. I gave my all to Him. I spent 50 years in a distant mission field serving the Lord. Now, don't be like me. Funny, I've never heard that conversation. 
Mickey Mantle was about to die. He called for one of his old ball-playing teammates to come see him. You know, he didn't call for Whitey Ford to come so they could have another drink before he died. And he really didn't call for Billy Martin to come and let's have one more good time because Billy Martin had already died and gone to hell. But do you know who he called for? He called for a guy named Bobby Richardson. Now, I know, you know, I like sports, and I know, you know what it's like. I mean, you get a football game, right? And at the end of the game, they all go out there, and they all bow their knee, and they all pray to somebody, and, and then they go out there and shoot people, and they get drunk, and they get high, and they beat up their wives, and, and they beat up dogs, and all the rest of it. You know, I understand how it works. And I know in America that we are used to a religion that is a good luck charm, and if I pray before the game, and God is going to bless me, I, I recognize that that's how people see God, but it wasn't like that 40, 50 years ago. When Bobby Richardson played, he was the real deal. When everybody else was drinking at night, he wasn't. Bobby Richardson was a bold testimony for Christ. And the professional athletes like Bobby Richardson that were bold for Jesus and they had a life that backed up their testimony, they were few and far between. And why they laughed at Bobby Richardson and his teammates mocked Bobby Richardson. But when Mickey Mantle was going to die, fascinating, he wanted the real Christian to come see him. Bobby Richardson came in that hospital room and Mickey Mantle said to him, he said, I, I called you here, Bobby, because I wanted you to hear it from me. I wanted you to know that I've trusted Christ as my Savior. Bobby Richardson was a little skeptical. He said, what are you basing that on, Mickey? And you know what Mickey Mantle did? He quoted John 3, 16. He said, come on. You think a guy could live like that, drink, carouse, do all this, and then get saved on his deathbed? Now, I'll tell you, if he could do it for the thief on the cross, he could do it for Mickey Mantle. But I'll promise you one thing. If Mickey Mantle got saved 15 years ago, he has spent the last 15 years walking up and down the street of glory, shaking his head, singing, years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died at Calvary, but mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There my burdened soul found liberty at Calvary. So, what's that one thing tonight? Just that one thing. That one thing that keeps you from being saved. That one thing that's more important than eternity. That one little thing you love so much that you've got to deal with. Oh, it could be for some religion. It could be for some there's a specific sin. Maybe somebody tonight you'd rather trust in your riches than trust in Christ or... Maybe somebody's got that dirty old pride that says, I am not trusting Christ as my Savior. So what's it going to take to deal with that one thing? Let's bow our heads.